Hi, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Advanced Ultrasound uh, teaching uh, for the week. And we're going to talk about one of our favourite topics here, which is diastolic dysfunction. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Tony McLean uh, to talk to us about this subject. Uh, he's taught me everything I know about diastolic dysfunction, so I'm going to be very happy to hear him talk about it again. Uh, Prof, it's all yours. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Um, I was asked to present this, and basically what I'm going to do is just talk about... Um, uh, it was a talk that I just gave last year at the European Society, and it really was LV diastolic function, what's known about it in the different clinical situations in the ICU, and I've got to be honest, not much. <laughs> so the interesting thing about diastolic function is that when you look at a heart like this, it's kind of easy, the systolic side of things, you see motion. And just looking at the left ventricle alone, although in this case you look at the left atrium being dilated as well, you get an idea of motion. The trouble, of course, is that it's between, it's a little like the old um, Chinese yin and the yang, and the yang being the part that is active, like feeling the pulse, seeing the movement, whereas the yin, in fact, is the opposite. It's the lack of motion, it's the lack of something that you see. And you might notice that I've actually got a tree trunk there. And the reason I put that up is because if you look very closely, there's something you don't see. And of course, if you look very closely there, you'll see a, a little snake that's completely camouflaged by the bark. And in some ways, that's what we do with diastolic dysfunction. We're going from measuring movement to trying to do the opposite, trying to figure out what's happening during relaxation and uh, the filling time of the left ventricle. Left ventricular function during diastole. Well, over the years, there's been a large number of ways that have been looked at. Uh, mitral inflow, of course, has been uh, the classical one and it has withstood the uh, test of time in many ways. Pulmonary venous waveform, very helpful, but once again, can you get a uh, reasonable waveform? We look at things like left atrial size, tricuspid uh, regurgitant gradient on the assumption that if you have elevated left ventricular in diastolic pressures, you have elevated left atrial pressures, and therefore you're going to have elevated pulmonary artery pressures. What's happened in the last two decades, of course, is the addition of mitral annulus TDI, which has been an extraordinary uh, leap forward in the assessment of the left ventricle. And as a result, we've ended up with a large number of parameters. And this is not them all, there's others as well, but I just put these down in the first instance to say that uh, over the years, there's been a search to find out which is the best way of determining diastolic function or left ventricular function during diastole. Um, and interestingly, in this little group, the IVRT is something we should probably use a lot more, but because we're not used to uh, using it, uh, we don't use it, but it's got good data behind it. And of course, left atrial strain has now come into the picture, although I'll be honest, I'm not going to talk about this. I have read some of the literature, but I'm not particularly au fait with how useful it is in the, uh, particularly in the critical care population in determining diastolic dysfunction. The biggest change in the last few years, and I know that you'll know this paper, this publication, and it's the guidelines put out by a number of experts and they went through all the data and practices and the bottom line is that if you really want to determine whether left ventricular diastolic function is normal or not that you hone down on these four variables and they are the annular e prime uh, velocity uh, whether it be the septal less than seven or the lateral less than ten your average E over E prime greater than 14, your left atrial maximum volume index of greater than 34 mils per meter squared, and your TR velocity greater than 2.8. And of course, I don't have to tell you that the controversy that has um, accompanied these guidelines uh, is never ending. And I have to say, I find them fascinating. And I personally have to say that you would not even begin to understand diastolic dysfunction if you don't have some understanding of this presentation. And the bottom line is that if you have a patient with normal left ventricular ejection, <laughs> you use the four criteria, you can basically at least divide between normal and the definite presence of diastolic dysfunction. 
with a number in between being indeterminate. And I won't go through those parameters, which I'm certain that you know rather well. So, for example, if you had a case like this, and this is a patient where if you take one by one, if you look at the average E over E prime, up in the top corner there, it's 14.6. If you look at the septal E prime, is it less than seven? Yes, well, it is. It's a 0.6 up there on the left, upper left-hand corner. Uh, upper right-hand corner, your E prime is less than 0.9, so you could use either of those. Uh, your TR velocity is greater than 2.8 at 2.99, and your left ventricular volume is 53 mils and it's slightly above normal but of course that's not indexed to meter squared which is which is something we should do in all our patients but we don't always index so essentially if you go through this um, uh, algorithm here then essentially you end up with diastolic dysfunction um, so that's a fairly straightforward one and just using those parameters you can be relatively confident but then I'd put you, over the years, why do we spend so much time on measuring diastolic dysfunction? If you happen to be in the cardiology circles and you're looking at patients with long-standing hypertension or some other disease that may affect the left ventricular wall, then yes, you can monitor them. You can get an idea what it was like in 2014. You can check it again in 2017. You can monitor it in 2022. Um, okay. What we really want to know with our patients is how do we optimize cardiac output? Our patients in shock, they might have diastolic dysfunction, well, so be it. But what we really want to know is how do we optimize our cardiac output in this particular setting? We want to actually optimise cardiac output at the same time, minimise cardiac work. And to do that, we have to evaluate left ventricular function with those objectives in mind. So you could use the clicker. So I'm trying to mess you up. Uh, You're good to go. Okay. So coming back to our interest in the yin and yang, if we're looking at cardiac output, which really is a combination of those two, because you have to have uh, both the filling during diastole, and the ejection during systole, then it's quite easy in this day and age to work out cardiac output. And uh, the system you know well using LBOT, VTI, and it's been proven in a number of settings to be particularly accurate in the great majority of intensive care patients. And of course, if we're looking at um, diastolic dysfunction, then what we're doing here, and this is just a short set of videos, is what we're trying to do is to say, during the period of diastole, which you see here on the uh, lower graph on the right, before you, um, well, in fact, you can look at the top one, before the uh, ejection of blood from the left atrium into the left ventricle, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to marry what we can actually measure, which is what's in the top right-hand corner, plus what we can see on the 2D, with our understanding of what the relationship between these two things are, and the pressures that we are measuring. So we know that at the peak of the E wave, um, we should be at the peak velocity, we should be having a gradient, which is the greatest difference between your left atrium and your, um, and your uh, left ventricular pressure, which is the difference between these two lines here. That's really what we are trying to measure. Uh, what we are measuring, I must say, and from this, we're trying to determine, in fact, what the uh, either the uh, ventricular pressure is or what the atrial pressure is. As we move along, of course, we come to the A wave. And what we're doing here by measuring, taking the velocity of the uh, A wave here, what we're really trying to do is to measure what this difference is here so we can actually evaluate, <coughs> pardon me, what exactly the pressure is here, whether you're going to use left ventricular end diastolic or left ventricular pressure at this point, or you're trying to measure the left atrial pressure at this point. Now, obviously, if you have a normal heart, um, then let me go back a bit. So that's really coming back to the point I want to make is that when we're looking at the E and the A, it's why it has been durable in the assessment of left ventricular uh, diastolic dysfunction. You should note that these, these um, algorithms all have been patients with normal LVEF, but in all honesty, 
I think for us critical care physicians, you can almost use exactly the same for those with uh, abnormal systolic function because there is no better algorithm. We know that if you've got systolic dysfunction, you're going to have some degree of diastolic dysfunction. And so I would suggest, or what I would do in this situation is also use the same algorithm where possible for this group for, um, for assessing diastolic dysfunction. So coming back to the mitral inflow, it's a very neat table, almost too neat, some would say, but let's have a look. It all has the first tier, which is to look at your mitral inflow. And so straight away in most patients, but not all, if you have an E over A less than 0.8 and an E velocity that's less than 50 centimetres per second, you can virtually say that all these people have normal left atrial pressure or at worst grade one diastolic dysfunction. If on the other hand, you have an E over A greater than two, then in many, or a great majority, but not all patients, you have an increased left atrial pressure or grade three diastolic dysfunction. And you notice what I'm doing there, and I thought that was the beauty of these guidelines, was for the first time they started talking about elevated left atrial pressure, as well as talking about diastolic dysfunction. Now, there are caveats. If you've got a 21 year old marathon runner, the chances are he or she will have an E over A greater than two. So in the very, in the younger adults, in the fit adults, then you can't rely on E over A being an automatic expression of um, diastolic dysfunction. But in the majority of our patients, it is a good guide as the first, um, as the first run. So, if we look here at the EO, to take the E over A as an example, if you take the one on the top right hand corner, you can see the E over A is two, and it's only slightly greater than two, but in this circumstance, according to this algorithm, you'd say this person has considerable diastolic dysfunction and or um, marked elevation of left atrial pressures based on this alone. Most of us would probably take it a little further, but if you only had to use one parameter, this is the one that would, you would use. Whereas in fact, uh, if you look at the one on the left, we have an E velocity of 0.5 and an E over A of 0.75, you'd have to say that would fall into the normal or the very mild diastolic dysfunction. And obviously the two lower ones, are the ones that fall in between, where you have to use other criteria to help you decide whether the, uh, there is diastolic dysfunction present or not. So let's look at another case. Here's a patient, in fact, who's got an E velocity of 0.75 and an E over A 0.64. Now, of course, if you were using the older guidelines, you would just look at that E over A and say, oh, it's reversed. So therefore, we're looking at grade one diastolic dysfunction, which it may or may not be. But because we're a little more, trying to be a little more accurate than that, what we would do is look at E prime, uh, either medial or lateral or both, and we look at a TV max of 2.8 meters per square. And you can see in this setting that uh, if we take the other parameters, we find that we've got an E over A E prime of 17, and we have a left ventricular volume index of greater than 47 mils, that should be per meter square. So if we look at the algorithm, you would find in this particular patient, your E over E prime is in the, is in the mid range, we can't rely on that alone. So we pop, go down to the next level, we can see that our E over E prime is greater than 14. We have the TR velocity, which sits on 2.8, so it could go either way. But your left atrial volume index is greater than 34 mils per meter squared. So that pushes us into saying that you've got, you've got um, at least moderate um, diastolic dysfunction and elevation of left atrial pressures. And this is really the summary of that there. You'd say it's consistent with grade two left ventricular diastolic dysfunction, which of course the purists would say, well, if I went on the E over E prime, E over A ratio alone, you might have picked that, but you might not, of course, because um, grade two in the old system is where you have pseudo normalization, where you actually have a um, E being greater than the A. So in this particular situation, you do glean more information suggesting that the left ventricular diastolic dysfunction is in fact greater than you would have suspected just by looking at that alone. The other thing to note, which is always a quick 
often helpful in a very quick way is to just look at your E prime over A prime ratio. And the good thing about this is that um, if it is abnormal, in so far as the A prime is greater than the A prime, you are going to have some degree of diastolic dysfunction as a rather crude way of looking at it. There are other methods, and I put this up from one of our colleagues that worked here, David Clancy, to say, well, I um, know, oh sorry, this is where David Clancy looked at um, uh, how useful were these guidelines in patients with severe sepsis and um, uh, septic shock. And what he did along with colleagues such as uh, Sam here and Michelle Slama, Stephen Huang and Tim Scully to say, well, look, let's look at these patients and look at them according to the two guidelines. The ones that were pre-2016, which were 2009, and you can see that in the uh, top two uh, diagrams here. And um, in the 2016 guidelines, if we use different criteria, is there a difference? Well, yes, there is. On day one, you can see that you couldn't determine diastolic dysfunction in 84% if you use the 2009 diastolic dysfunction guidelines. Whereas using the updated guidelines, um, you could, that indeterminate number fell to 30%, giving an indication of um, uh, the number here that was 16%. Uh, now you have some sort of inkling in, uh, in over 60%, in fact, 65% as to what sort of abnormality they had if they, or they had none at all. Just as part of the study, it was also done at day three in the same patients. And you can see the indeterminate nature is still very high at day three. Once again, we could still, in the majority of patients, at day three determine, and these patients with septic shock, who were normal, who had diastolic dysfunction, and what grade you would give them. So the new guidelines, in fact, we believe have a place. Can I just say one yep. thing that I find quite interesting? One of the big differences that we found between those 2009 and 2016 guidelines was that left atrial size. Yep. And what the, the indeterminants got smaller between day one and day three in the 2009 because their left atrium had then dilated in some of them. And that's one of the big things I find useful about those 2016 is the left atrium doesn't have to be dilated for you to have diastolic dysfunction. That's true. Yep. And the left atrium, which will we could touch upon that now since it's been raised. Of course, that's always the difficulty with these guidelines. In the acute setting, if you've got a patient, for example, that comes into the intensive care unit and has long-standing diastolic dysfunction, then you'll have a dilated left atrium. If you have someone who comes in with, with only a recent problem uh, that results in elevated left atrial pressures, then you cannot use the left atrial size uh, accurately because it doesn't dilate up for at least a week or two. Um, and this is just, uh, I guess that's really more of what we were talking about a short while ago um, on day one and day three. Uh, the, uh, this is a different group. These are the, I'll go back. This, of course, with the patients with normal LVEF, but if we took the patients with an abnormal LVEF, which was rated at less than 52%, once again, you can see we get uh, much more clarification as to the degree of diastolic dysfunction. <coughs> These are the limitations that we mentioned uh, that uh, we were all aware of is that the E over E prime average of being greater than 14, and I quote this from Filippo Sanfilippo and his colleagues that was published in Annals of Intensive Care in 2018. Are you sure you've got an accurate E over E prime? You know, although we say uh, it's slightly different for both, septal should be higher or lateral a little less, or do you take a medium? It's a matter of debate. But you have to have optimum alignment of mitral inflow in the apical four chamber group. And I have seen a recent paper, which is not published yet, by our French colleagues, Michelle Slama's group, that uh, suggests that the lateral E prime is a lot more accurate in giving you this information. And of course, some people just sort of put the sampling uh, box there and hope it's right, but you've got to make sure your pulse wave sampling volume is uh, no greater than three millimeters, but is greater than one. Once again, if you're looking at the uh, other inaccuracies, have you got a regional wall motion abnormality? Have you got a mitral annular calcification? Have you got a prosthetic valve, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Left atrial volume index, as we mentioned, it's a late change. Um, and of course you can get left atrial dilatation with other causes mitral valve disease, atrial fibrillation, and intraatrial shunt, high cardiac upward states.
And once again, chi r velocity of greater than 2.5. Often you can't get a good uh, uh, envelope from the tricuspid regurgitant jet. So you've got to keep in mind that there are a number of limitations that uh, when we're examining these patients. Now, let's just go back a bit. Okay, we've talked about using the guidelines, but are they accurate at all? Do we think they actually have any value whatsoever? And this is a question that's been asked by groups around the world. And um, here's some studies looking at, uh, these are non-critically ill patients. None of these are done in critically ill patients, or only one or two uh, with using pulmonary artery catheter. But these are studies measuring the LAP non-invasively um, and by direct measurement. This is a paper by Nauta in, um, in the European Journal of Heart Failure in 2018, where they took the correlation of invasive left ventricular filling pressures and prognostic relevance of the 2016 guidelines. It's a systematic review. It was in patients with preserved ejection fraction, as mentioned, non critically ill patients. And as you can see, if you look over here, what was the setting? A number of them were, were ambulant patients, outpatients. And so uh, the other thing to notice is what do you mean by invasive left ventricular filling pressure measurement? And you'll notice down here that for a lot of them, it's the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, while for others, it's the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. So it's a mixture of both of these that were used in the um, systemic review. So how accurate were the guidelines? Well, they found nine studies. Heart failure preserved ejection fraction, once again, what's the preserved ejection fraction? They took an LVEF of 45%, which would have been measured by the Simpsons method in the majority of cases. Uh, so you have a question mark there. Uh, they looked at individual parameters, such as the ovary prime, left ventricular volume index, et cetera, et cetera, of which the ovary prime obviously is the one that's most commonly studied. And they found that E ovary prime alone had only modest correlation, and they recommended against, against its use, which was very sad for those of us who found this parameter came into use in, I think, about 2000. Um, then we thought it was the answer to all our... Uh, wishes in terms of uh, left atrial pressure, but over the years, this is a common finding. It's only got modest correlation and few studies validated individual parameters at rest. Going through it all though, if you looked at the four parameters from the 2000 guidelines, the one we just went through, you find that 65% of the patients with a normal non-invasive LAP had a normal LAP. Whereas 79% of those with an elevated non-invasive left atrial pressure had an elevated um, invasive left atrial pressure. So it gives a sensitivity of about 75% and a specificity of about 74%. So in that group of patients that we're talking about, it's about 75% accurate. So let's answer that rather tricky question. If you're using a pulmonary artery catheter as your golden standard, how accurate is that? This is a paper from Hemnes and Chest in 2018 from Vanderbilt University, where they looked at 2,270 patients who underwent concurrent right and left heart catheterization for over 16 years. And they went back and looked at what was the difference that you found with a wedge pressure as to what you found with an invasive left ventricular end diastolic pressure, which of course is the real gold standard. And it looks pretty good to start with because the mean difference is only 1.6 millimeters of mercury, which you've got to say is not too bad. However, the correlation is terrible, it's 0 0.6. And I just put these two graphs up to give you an idea of what we are dealing with in reality. If you are using a pulmonary artery catheter as your guide, and um, if you look at the, um, the uh, agreement here, you'll see that in fact that the agreement, uh, the difference is considerable. Um, it's 15.2 uh, between that of the mean and the difference between the two. And if you look at the correlation, let's just take, which is commonly used to pulmonary um, artery wedge pressure of around about 15. You can see that if you have a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of around about 15, then you have a range of measured left ventricular invasive pressures 
anywhere between about five all the way up to about 38. And as you can see, the spread there is, uh, is really quite daunting when you're thinking that you rely so much of your so much on your pulmonary capillary ridge pressure. And this is why so many publications that we've seen over the years using pulmonary capillary ridge pressure as a guide to whether you have um, an accurate echo assessment or some other assessment, why there's so much um, difference amongst the studies in the uh, literature. And as you can see in total, 42% of the patients differed by greater than five millimeters of mercury or 64% differed by greater than 20% um, respectively. So in many ways, it just raises a question about whichever study you're looking at, just have a look as to what's being measured or used as a gold standard. Um, in the same vein, this is another study which did something a similar, but a little different, where they looked at saying, well, we're looking at all these patients in whom we're trying to uh, um, diagnose pulmonary hypertension. And as you know, if you want to use some rather expensive drugs for pulmonary hypertension, you have to show that it's primary pulmonary hypertension or it's not due to left ventricular failure. And they went over and looked at 3,926 patients who had had a combination of both um, wedges and left ventricular end diastolic pressures performed. And as you can see there on the left, you can see the correlation there. And most importantly, if you happen to be in this uh, quarter, it's pretty good. This quarter is pretty good. If you're less than 15, it says you're less than 15. However, you've got a very large number of people in who the pulmonary capillary ridge pressure is less than 15, but your measured end diastolic pressure is really quite high. And the reverse here, where it says it's high, but in fact, the measurement is low. So all these people will be misclassified as primary pulmonary hypertension, when in fact they're not. And here's the bland altman uh, scatter plot, which shows in fact there's uh, really quite a bit of difference. And what it shows that in fact, um, uh, 580 patients who um, met the criteria of pulmonary hypertension with a wedge, um, uh, it was inaccurate. And um, 310 of these, half of these, sorry, I should go back. 580 patients met the criteria for pulmonary hypertension out of the 4,320 4, patients that were actually um, uh, investigated. But 53% of these patients, in fact, had an LV EDP of uh, greater than 15 millimeters of mercury, giving you uh, considerable inaccuracy. Okay. Let's look at another patient then. Let's look at these guidelines and we're trying to measure patients who are going from an invasive cardiac catheter, but they have a transthoracic echo done just beforehand. Now, I want to say the other thing is that when we talk about left atrial pressure, um, uh, if you go back to the diagram I showed you, the left atrium doesn't have a constant pressure. It depends on fact what you are measuring. For example, if you're measuring pulmonary artery catheter, you're not actually measuring the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. You're measuring what we call the pre-A pressure. So in this particular study, it was the pre-A the pre-A wave pressure that was measured at the end of expiration, and um, greater than 12 millimeters of mercury was considered elevated. Please note the uh, variation: is it 12? Is it 15? Um, and excluded, of course, is uh, these patients, which uh, obviously all those patients that are in our intensive care unit. So although this is an in interesting read, you're almost discarded by saying, in fact, they're not our patients who are usually hemodynamically unstable. They often have atrial fibrillation, et cetera, et cetera. However, cut a long story short, they found that the non-invasive left atrial pressure was accurate in 61 of the 90 patients and then incorrect in 20 of the uh, 90 patients. So once again, it gives an over accuracy of about 75%, which is in keeping with the previous study to say, you're probably correct about three quarters of the time. There is a little caveat in there, which we'll come on to with the ovary prime in a moment. Um, the message for the clinician is that LAP by echo doctor is about 75% accurate using the 2016 guidelines, which the, with the best information we have available. There are no 
real good comparative studies on critical ill patients because they're not the patients we're going to put um, uh, pressure transducers into to measure their um, to measure their uh, left atrial left ventricular pressure or their left atrial pressure. And single parameters are too unreliable. And I'm really not going to go to that in any big details except to say that even E over E prime is unreliable. Although I'd have to say that um, at each end of the spectrum, the um, the sensitivities, the specificity is not good, but the sensitivity, if you have a really high E over E prime, then the chances are that you do have elevated pressures. Prof, can I ask you a question? Because so Michel Slama says that he uses an E to E prime of more like 18 rather than 15 is that cutoff for the raised left ventral left atrial pressure. Is that what you recommend doing as well? Or do you and that's on his data. That's what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah. If you've got a high one greater than 18, good sensitivity. Virtually, you've yeah. got good sensitivity. And the other way, if it's less than about eight, it's got good sensitivity. And then all the other, zone in between. In between, don't well, use it. Nice. And that's what the studies say as well. And of course, what we have is, and this is just to make the point in our patients, we have all these confounding factors. And these studies are not done on these particular patients. Um, and most of our patients are likely to have some degree of left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. So I guess for me, what is the reality for me as a critical care physician? There are certain things that tell you you don't really have to measure anything. If you have a picture like LVH is in the upper, upper left-hand corner with a big muscular left ventricle like that, with that slow contraction and relaxation, you're going to have considerable diastolic dysfunction. If you have uh, a patient with LVH and left um, ventricular wall hypertrophy and a big left atrium, you are going to have elevated left atrial pressure. Same for diastolic, a dilated cardiomyopathy and of course they're monoidos. So there are certain things by looking, just by observing the 2D in the acute situation, you know automatically, uh, even if you've got normal LV systolic function, these people are gonna have a significant degree, if not measurable, of diastolic dysfunction. Elevated left atrial pressure. The left atrium is important. And I know people often say, oh, well, it doesn't dilate up quickly in the ICU, so you forget it. But a lot of our patients are elderly. They come in with dilated left, ventric uh, left atriums. And so always measure it. Measure it this way. Don't do the old method by a long parish journal with a single measurement. It's so easy to measure it with Simpson's method this way. Automatically do it. If you can, we don't always do it, I must say, unless we are doing a study for some other research or whatever, you should probably do it as per um, bodies uh, per meter square. This sign is a very important sign and it is so intuitive that once you start using it, you get so used to using it as that in fact if you've got fixed bowing of the interatrial septum towards the right atrium uh, in, in any of your patients, you have elevated left atrial pressure in the story. So if more than subjective or a simple E over E, uh, e, over e analysis is ready, then use the 2016 guidelines. Uh, here they are again. You should know them off by heart. Yes, there's a lot of controversy. Yes, people will argue about them. We argue about them. But the reality is that at the end of the day, uh, use a roadmap. You need some sort of measurement to guide you. And we are aware that nothing is perfect. And so, that's my presentation on left ventricular and diastolic, left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. Thank you, Prof. Um, that was brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so if you had to design a study in the critically ill, what, what would you think would be the best way of trying to investigate? Because it's, there's not a lot of evidence out there about diastolic dysfunction in the critically ill. So what would you be looking for from the literature in the next you know, five years to help guide us on this? Because particularly, I guess, we're talking about the ones that I think about is the you know septic septic patients or patients who are under some form of stress and their heart's going super fast and they've got diastolic dysfunction and you don't have enough time for them to relax. You know, are those the ones that we need to slow down? You know, that's my thoughts. But what do you think is the way that we should be studying this? In what direction? Uh, first of all, I, I actually think it's a very good point. The parameters that are in use here and all the other ones that we know about but we don't use, the pulmonary, the pulmonary venous waveform, your, um, uh, your various um, VP uh, 
uh, or whatever you use with colour Doppler. They've all been tried and they've all been found to be lacking. And I'm not too sure we're going to pick up any more runs on the board with these parameters. So what our problem is that we have to try and decide either to go down the path of being able to accurately measure left ventricular end diastolic pressure, if not invasively, but by a much more accurate method than pulmonary artery catheters. And I'm not aware of one. We've looked at this, but there is nothing there. Or B, we should be looking further afield. And I think the strain of the left atrium has mm. potential. And um, I suspect that if we look, instead of looking at left ventricular end diastolic pressure, let's move our focus to the left atrium and strain is the new kid on the block. There are some interesting findings. Um, that would be my thought. Oh, yeah. Do you have anything? Well, I, I guess hearing you talk about this again, obviously I've heard you talk about this a few times and it's a great talk. But one of the things that I've always kind of confused in my head is the difference, you know, do, do I really care about left ventricular and diastolic pressure or am I just looking for raised left atrial pressure? You know, are they sort of the same thing? Are we diagnosing them the same way? Because I kind of split in this. And so I'm trying to think about what I care about when I'm looking after my patient at the bedside. Like that patient you've got who was intubated, a bit obese, hypertension, got a bit of sepsis. I guess I, I've got to try and think... You know, do, does this change the sort of inotropes or catecholamines that I want to give? Does it change my idea about giving fluid or wanting to take fluid off? Because I think it does. You know, if you've got someone who's got nasty diastolic dysfunction and they're going super fast, they're the ones that I should probably think about slowing down. But I still get nervous about giving them a negative inotropic drug like a beta blocker that's got this sort of, you know, it, it's not great for cardiac contractility. So it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to give beta blockers to someone I'm also giving like NORAD to. But then also if you've got someone who's got raised left atrial pressure, that kind of points me to think oh, I need to try and pull fluid off them because their left atrium is already under strain. And that's kind of the way I've been thinking about it. But I don't have a lot of great evidence behind that, I guess. And so what I'd love to see is studies that use the best that we've got, which would be maybe using an E2E prime of 18, using an idea of using Michelle Slama of saying we've got to take TDIs, either lateral or medial or an average, you know, less than a certain level, that would indicate bad myocardial relaxation. And using that as our focal point to then go on to try and decide what to do with the patient. So I think using the echo as the inclusion criteria to a study and then giving them a beta blocker or not, something, I, I haven't quite figured it all out, obviously, but I think that's what we need to do, similar to how I think I practice using echo and looking after my patients true and in fact i'd say that um as i said the beauty about these guidelines is to i think we should be thinking left atrial pressures left ventricular end uh, left ventricular end diastolic pressure we can't measure diastolic dysfunction well so be it what i really want to know in these patients is have they got left i need to know their cardiac output and i need to know their left atrial pressure because at the end of the day, the first thing we're going to talk about is fluid, give it, take it off, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the left atrial pressure is the guide to that. So if you had to choose between just talking in terms of left ventricular diastolic dysfunction or talking about left atrial pressure, I would just talk about left atrial pressure. So the reality is then, can we get a handle on left atrial, a better handle on left atrial pressure? And one of the things that we've tended not to, not to look at closely is that the left atrial pressure is not constant. So exactly what are we measuring? Mm. Um, we are only measuring two points when the left atrial pressure is greater than the left ventricular pressure when we get inflow with the E wave and inflow with the A wave. And from that, we're trying to figure the rest of it out. Now, that's where the, um, the uh, interventricular uh, measurements become into play to yeah. say, let's look at the time it takes to relax. Let's look at the time it takes to contract. And let's manipulate that work um, uh, because that's probably an area with the most, the best potential, I think. Mm. Like Susanna Price's work. Susanna Price's work, exactly. Nice. And they've been doing that, particularly in patients who've got biventricular paces where you can actually adjust the timing and they get really good results. Unfortunately, not all our patients have biventricular paces and where you can just juggle it. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of it's going to do with how we measure the timing. Right. Um, how about, are there any other questions from anyone else? Yes, I want to know, when you say 
left atrial pressures. All we're getting from this is increased left atrial pressures. There's no absolute numbers. No. So you just do uh, a little well, thing and then see the result and then do a little bit more and see the result. That's the crudity of where we are at the moment because, of course, I didn't show you all the studies, but when you compare the guidelines to invasive studies and you saw our left ventricular left atrial pressure, what are they measuring? Well, some are actually measuring right at the end of diastole, which is post aortic Others are moving, others are measuring before the A wave, which is the pre A, which is what the pulmonary artery catheter does. Others are taking an average. So in the first instance, we're very crude in what we're talking about in the first place. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And you've access to it, yeah. That's him, yeah. Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, so two questions. The first of them is regarding the uh, assessment of the sort dysfunction in the presence of atrial fibrillation. So you do the A wave, and uh, then you have to rely only on the E wave and the tissue doctor. And the second is a comment of uh, whether, uh, just continuing with what you have been discussing, whether the consideration that you can measure the pulmonary venous flow uh, and identify any reversible flow, like sort of dynamic measure, you give fluid bolus and then you identify whether there is any uh, systolic reversal of the flow that would reflect that the left atrium can't accommodate any more fluid, especially that both of them are intrathoracic and they won't be affected with uh, much variation in the respiration. Um, of course, to get good measurements on your pulmonary venous flow, you really got to be doing toes because that's where you'll get clean signals all the time. You might get a clean ones with your transthoracics, but you've got to be sure that you're sampling very accurate each time and your idea is a good one. Um, I haven't seen it done at all. I should also say that if you get into the more deeply, there's, there's another parameter here that I use quite often when I'm stuck, and that's the deceleration time. And your deceleration time is less than 160. That really pushes you towards an elevated left atrial pressure. Just when you're looking for things where it's all gray and you're looking for some outlet. Um, your first question to do with atrial fibrillation, look, I guess TDI has saved us somewhat. Before we had TDI, then it was all a guesswork. Yes, we lose, it's guesswork anyway, but um, we lose the E over A when we're in atrial fibrillation, but that's the only thing we lose if you look at the rest of these parameters, because now we've got E over E prime we can measure, TR we can measure, LA we can measure. So atrial fibrillation, yes, it's a bit of a nuisance, uh, but it doesn't rule out using these guidelines. What it does do, though, is you'll notice that when they go to do a comparison of the guidelines with invasive measures, uh, they often exclude patients with atrial fibrillation, so there is that uncertainty in there as well. well were, there, were there any other questions for Prof? Uh, I had a question. Hi, Benny. Benny. Oh, you there? Look. Okay. Uh, okay. Alrighty. Thank you. Benny, sure you don't have a question? Oh, we missed it. All right. Um, well, I guess let's call it quits on that. Then. Oh, you back? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Yes, did, we can. Did, did oh. you have a question, Bernie? Wasn't sure. Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Far away. Um, so I, I struggle to, uh, I guess, accept the diagnosis of diastolic dysfunction using the algorithm when you have another explanation. So, or concurrent disease like mitral valve disease, and then that can cause, which is possibly the cause of your dilated left atrium, your raised pulmonary pressures, and and so how do you how do you differentiate what's causing what? Is the diastolic dysfunction causing the LA dilation and higher pulmonary pressures, or is it the mitral valve disease? You can't differentiate. The bottom line, you can't differentiate. Um, and uh, you have to take all those confounders into association in, into account because you cannot, with the tools that we have, you can't differentiate what is due to the mitral valve disease or what is due to the left ventricular wall dysfunction. Um, but there is an area that really is quite interesting in a similar in a similar vein is that, and you often get it in dialysis. If patients who are on dialysis who go into fluid overload. And when you test them, they seem to have really marked 
although they've got good systolic function, they appear to have very marked diastolic dysfunction. But as soon as you take all the fluid off, your diastolic function mm -hmm. parameters virtually return to normal. And then you realize the parameters were actually measuring elevated left atrial pressures and not diastolic dysfunction. So there are all these little um, interesting caveats that you have in there. But to answer your question straight, you can't differentiate. So. Okay, thanks. I was just going to say that you need to do a study where you implant a cardio MEMS into some of these people in their left atrium rather than their pulmonary artery and see what happens. That's what you're chasing. I'll let you take that to the CAMS Ethics Committee. <laughs> <laughs> it's CAMS mate, anything flies. <laughs> no, nice, thanks. Can't do studies up there. Um, all right, well, uh, Prof, thank you very, very much uh, indeed. Uh, great talk. Thanks a lot. See you next week, guys. Thanks a lot.